The idea of authorship is central to our understanding of our society and our economy today. And yet, the idea of the author only became popular in the past one or two hundred years. Before that, it was not human beings who were creative. It was God. God created the world, and it was the role of the artist or the writer to accurately reflect the majesty of God's creation. But with the upheavals of the Industrial Revolution, the rise of capitalism, and the enclosures in England that I talked about in another video, society was under great pressure. People lost their place in the social structure. They were often impoverished, just seeking for a way to make a living or get enough to eat. England's vision of itself as a rural society, one in which the peasants lived in a certain harmony with nature, no longer reflected the reality. For the peasants, with the enclosures, lost their ability to live off the land and went to the cities looking for work. And the relationship between the common people and the country squires or nobility was disintegrating. And so thinkers asked, how are the common people to learn how to live? How are they to learn ethics and morality? How are we to structure our society? How are people to learn deference when things are all in flux? And the romantic poets at the same time looked back on England before all this turmoil at the peasant rural economy of the past with nostalgia. And they even wrote about the ruins, as Wordsworth did, for example, in Tintern Abbey, talking about a ruined church surrounded by birds singing in the trees. One of the places that a solution was found was culture. Culture doesn't only mean art and writing and literature. It also suggests something to do with ethics. The idea of a cultured person as someone who appreci appreciates the finer things in life and also someone who knows how to act correctly and behave correctly within society. And so the artist, who in the past had been essentially a craftsperson, just as a carpenter might make a table or a chair, a painter would paint a picture, or a writer would write a poem, now the artist had a special role to educate the population. The poet is an upholder and preserver, carrying everywhere with him relationship and love. The poet binds together by passion and knowledge the vast empire of human society. Poetry is the first and last of all knowledge. It is as immortal as the heart of man, wrote the po romantic poet William Wordsworth in 1798. So now the artist isn't simply reflecting reality. He, for it was usually he, is illuminating it. He's contributing a certain light or understanding that is bringing forth the truth of the natural order of things. Meyer Abrams writes about this tr transition in his book, The Mirror and the Lamp. And as the artist now had a special role in society, the artist started to be seen as a special person in society with unique characteristics. I am certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of imagination. What the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth. The imagination may be compared to Adam's dream. He awoke and found it truth, wrote John Keats in 1817. So here, the poet, the writer, is doing more than reflecting, or more than even illuminating. There's something special and unique in the individual that's being expressed in his or her art. And this is the full-fledged vision of the romantic author. We can imagine the individual working alone by candlelight, feverishly writing in the dark of his room at night, trying to express on paper the dreams in his head and create something new, something original that had not existed before and that is unique to him. Shakespeare's works are so many windows through which we see a glimpse of the world that was in him, wrote Thomas Carlyle in 1840. J. Middleton Murray provides a more contemporary variation of the same idea. To know a work of literature is to know the soul of the man who created it. This is at the heart of criticism today, that understanding art, understanding literature, entails understanding the person who wrote or created that thing. That idea of the romantic author as an individual who creates something from the depths of his or her soul, something new and original in the world, is at the heart of copyright and patent law and how they're applied today. This is explained in depth by James Boyle in his book, Shaman Software and Spleens. Boyle looks at a number of cases in U.S. copyright and patent law that would appear to be inconsistent. But when he looks at them through the lens of romantic authorship, 
that makes sense. But the idea of the romantic author, although there is truth to it, it is also something of a myth. And it sustains today's mass media industries. But I'm going to explain some of the problems with that in another video or videos.